friends. Welcome back to History Obscura. Happy 2023. Today, I'm doing a little review of a lovely book called The Time Traveler's Guide to Medieval England. This is written by Ian Mortimer. And it's not a new book, but it's one I've been waiting for. And since it came in my Christmas stocking, I thought I'd have a quick read and then let you know some of my favorite parts. You might have noticed that one of my favorite things about history is food. So take a seat, grab your tea and biscuits, and let's pretend that you are about to visit the medieval land of England in the 14th century. The modern traveler, coming from an age of good food guides and supermarkets, is liable to forget that people in medieval England still starve to death. The Great Famine takes place in 1315 to 1317, and that's just one of at least eight documented droughts or floods or otherwise bad years for harvest. And those are just bad years for wheat. There are just as many paltry harvests for all the other cereal crops, and when any one of them fails, people suffer. If a season's storms leave all the crops underwater and rotting in the fields, and the cattle, sheep, and pigs drown in the swollen rivers and mud, or catch waterborne diseases, there's simply nothing for the poor man and his family to eat except the fruit from the trees, if there is any, or the preserved remains of last year's harvest. When two years' crops fail in succession, families die. The undernourished children perish first, susceptible to diseases in their weakened state, but it is not long before the adults follow. Men and women will eat anything. Herbs, grass, drock and darnel, vetches, acorns, and even bark in their efforts to stay alive. They turn to crime, stealing food and livestock whenever they can. Sometimes, the king and his council try to relieve the situation, but there is little they can do except lower the duties on imported grain. This has no effect outside the major towns, for the rural peasantry cannot physically transport themselves to buy the corn. Even if they could make the journey, they could not afford to pay the inflated prices being charged. The pangs of starvation are felt just as severely by those caught in a siege. When you find yourself in a castle or town with overwhelming force beyond the gates, you may well have to decide between two terrible fates, surrender and death by hanging on the one hand, or resistance and the likelihood of a slow death through starvation on the other. Those who choose the latter may suffer the most unimaginable tortures from lack of food. If you visit Calais in the summer of 1347, you will see how bad things can get. At the outset of this siege in September of 1346, the French captain of the town expels most of the women, the children, the old and the unfit, so there are only able-bodied men left. Over the next 11 months, those men use up all their supplies. They eat every animal in the town. That's every dog, cat, and horse. By July, they are catching rats and eating those. When they finally give in, on August 4th of 1347, it is because, as the captain states in a letter to the French king, they have nothing left to eat but each other and they would rather die on the battlefield than consume the flesh of their friends and relatives. Calais is an extreme case, and this chapter is predominantly concerned with tastier things than rats, horses, and dogs. Nevertheless, the extremes are worth bearing in mind as you peruse the metaphorical menus of medieval England. A number of your favorite foods will not be available. There are no potatoes or tomatoes, as these come from lands yet to be discovered. For the same reason, there are no turkeys. Your Christmas dish instead, if you can afford it, is likely to be a swan, a goose, beef, ham, or bacon. You will search the markets in vain for carrots, which have yet to be developed from their inedible purple wild variety. Rice is imported only in small amounts, and pasta, 
although regularly made in Italy and Sicily, has yet to make an appearance in England. Like all true travelers, you have no option but to eat the local food, and in many cases you will find that the only alternative is hunger. If an unchanging diet of boiled bacon, rye bread, and peas does not appeal, then consider yourself lucky not to be stuck in a house in which the bacon has gone rancid, the flour has been eaten by rats, and the peas have become damp and rotted. The modern convention of three square meals per day does not apply in medieval England. Here, you will eat just two. With the exception of a few high-status, self-indulgent individuals, people do not normally have breakfast. A householder might take some bread and cheese on rising, especially if he is planning to ride a long distance or be very active, but on the whole, he will eat nothing until dinner. This, the main meal of the day, usually takes place between 10 and 11 o'clock in the morning, depending on the season. It is followed by supper, a more modest affair, in the late afternoon, between 4 and 5 o'clock. Although the medieval diet does not come close to our ideas of healthy eating, for example, boiling cabbage until all the vitamin C has been destroyed, in one sense it has merit, for it delivers the greatest boost of energy in the late morning, when people still have most of the day to work off the calories. Another important gastronomic rhythm arises from the strict rules about eating meat. The church forbids the consumption of animals on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, and throughout Lent and Advent. This equates to just over half the year. In Lent, even the eating of eggs is forbidden. As this applies to the whole of society, even the king, no host or patron, will break the rule in your presence. Anyone who does eat meat on a non-meat day is liable to find himself or herself hauled up before the church courts. It is a sin and will play upon a man or woman's conscience until he or she is relieved by confession and indulgence or a penance imposed by the courts. The third layer of dietary rhythms is simply that of seasonal availability. Fruit is fresher in autumn, and at harvest time all sorts of things become plentiful, from white bread to pies and flans. Meat is also more plentiful in late autumn. The expense of feeding animals through the winter months means that many are slaughtered at Martinmas, the 11th of November. Some are roasted and eaten straight away, others are salted for consumption during the winter. Obviously, garden produce is seasonal. In fact, vegetables are arguably the most seasonal products of all, as there is little monetary value in them and thus no long-distance trade. As for fish, more fresh varieties are available in summer when the seas are not so rough and the merchants coming from the coastal towns have longer daylight hours to transport their cargoes to inland markets. In winter, market fish is mainly salted or dried. Even the form in which things are cooked varies with the seasons. A great deal of cooking takes place out of doors in summer. This is partly because of the weather, and partly because keeping a large fire burning on the hearth of a small house tends to make it unbearably hot. Communal cooking of roast meat is common in late summer and autumn. In winter, food is older and more often boiled. For all these reasons, a request for your favorite food when you fancy it, especially if it is a meat product, can only rarely be satisfied. Times of day, days of the week, and seasons of the year all matter much more than they do in the modern world. As for households, there are those of both rich and poor peasants. And it goes without saying, though I am, that married yeomen with 30 acres have a better diet than poor single laborers with no land or garden. It also goes without saying, again, that hungry travelers are not welcome in a place where food is scarce. But let us say you find yourself sitting down at a yeoman's table, like that in the Three Bay House described earlier in the chapter. 
there could be several sorts of bread in front of you. At the start of the century, dark rye bread is common, as is bread made from wheat and rye mixed together, known as maslin. It's unlikely that before 1350 you will be offered fine white bread in a yeoman's house, but on special days, considering you are a guest, it might happen if your host keeps a portion of his land sufficiently enriched with dung for growing wheat. On other days, you might find bread made from barley, or oats, or a mixture of oats and wheat. You might be offered oat cakes as well as bread. And if these do not tempt you, consider eating a horse bread. This is made from a sort of flour of ground peas, bran, and beans. If contemporaries look at you strangely, it is because it is not meant for human consumption. But in some places, you might be expected to eat the brown, whole grain bread known as tort. When this gets old, it's cut into slices and used for trenchers or plates. After use, the trenchers are given to the pigs to eat, soaked in the juices of the meal. Nothing is wasted in a peasant's household. Even the plates are edible. As you've gathered, bread is an important part of the medieval peasant's diet. Accordingly, its price is controlled by law, that is, the assize of bread. The buying of bread, however, is a typically urban activity. Your rural yeoman is more likely to make his own. He or his wife will take their corn to the manorial mill, normally a water mill, but just possibly an early wooden windmill, where the miller will grind it and take a small proportion in payment, normally a sixteenth or twenty-fourth. If the yeoman has a stone or a clay oven in one of his outhouses, he and his wife might bake the bread themselves. Otherwise, they will take their ground corn to the village baker for baking. The end product might be kept up to a week in the home, although when it is that old, it is usually only used for trenchers and animal feed. If there is any rival to bread as the staple of food in the English peasantry, it is pottage. There are thick and thin pottages, from thick white porridge made with oats, and runny green pottage made with peas, to white made with leeks. Your host will expect your eyes to light up when he sets before you a bowl of pottage containing peas, herbs, some bacon, and white beans. The most basic ingredients are meat stock, chopped herbs, oats, and salt. But beyond that, almost anything can go in. Breadcrumbs are often used as a thickener. If you take a wooden spoon and start digging around, you're likely to find onions and garlic and other garden produce, such as cabbage. The peas might either be the small green sort with which you are familiar, or they might be a white variety. In poor peasants' houses, large gray peas are used. As with everything else which is green or greenish, these are boiled thoroughly prior to eating. There is a widespread understanding that green vegetables, cabbages in particular, are not good for you, and potentially harmful if raw. It is likely that the vegetables served in a peasant's house all come from his own garden. If you look around it, you will see that there are a few ornamental shrubs or flowering plants, except for lavender and sweet-smelling roses, and the only trees are productive fruit trees. There is no lawn. The garden has no recreational element in its design. Instead, there are rows of herbs and vegetables. If the peasant wants to eat turnips or to feed them to his animals, he needs to grow them himself. More to the point, if he wants a safeguard in case of a complete harvest failure, growing turnips is good insurance policy. Gardens thus fulfill a twofold function sustenance, and taste. The fields are essential for his cereal crop, and the manorial pastures and downlands are important for grazing his animals, but the greatest variety in his diet comes from his garden. How proud he is of his onions, garlic, peas, leeks, chibbles, cabbages, beans, parsley, and sage. If there are well-kept fruit trees in the orchard, 
then no doubt his family eats well, and not just in autumn, for fruit can be preserved for a long time, both naturally and in preserves and pickles. Everyone keeps apples, but looks for pears, cherries, plums, grapes, walnuts, and damsons. Gooseberries, strawberries, and mulberries are also occasionally cultivated. Blackberries and sloes are so commonly found in the wild that there is no need to grow them. But what about meat, you ask? What about dairy? Where do these figure in the peasant's diet? After all, that meat stock in the best pottage has to come from somewhere, as does the bacon. That's true, but do not forget that a meaty broth was in honor of a guest, and meat stock can be made to last a very long time, with the bones being boiled and reboiled. The fact is that many peasants, especially the Yens, do not have many opportunities to eat meat. As the poet William Langland puts it, I have no money to buy pullets, nor geese, nor pigs, but two green cheeses, a few curds and cream, and a cake of oats, and two loaves of beans and bran to bake for my children. And yet, I say by my soul, I have no salt bacon, nor eggs by Christ to make collops, but I have parsley, leeks, and many cabbages, and a cow and a calf and a cart horse to draw dung to my field while the drought lasts. And by this livelihood might we live to Lammas tide, when I hope to have my harvest in my croft, so I may serve a dinner to my heart's delight. Then all the poor people fetched peas cods, beans, and baked apples they brought in their laps, chibbles and chervil and ripe cherries many, and proffered pierce this present to appease hunger. Meat is the food of the rich, and is in demand not only by the rich, but by all those yeomen and townsmen who would like to be seen living like the rich. It is thus a status symbol, and it follows that those at the bottom of the social ladder eat much less of it than those at the top. Nor is it easy for those at the bottom to make up for this disadvantage by catching wild animals. Hunting of game is rarely permitted, being reserved for the lord of the manor. The provision of food and drink in a medieval monastic establishment is nearly as complicated as that in a nobleman's household. Although the monks are all equal in the eyes of God, they are far from equal in their own eyes. The abbot gets the best food and also gets to share the lordly fare provided in his house to the monastery's noble guests, who stay with him in his lodging. Certain monastic officers, such as the almoner, sacrist, infirmerer, and chamberlain, have rights to better fish and more exotic fruit than the other monks. Those monasteries which have lay brothers provide them with their own refectory, kitchen, and diet. Guests staying in the monastic guest house may be given a different diet altogether. On one level, you could describe the monastic household as a lordly one, with the abbot or prior as the lord. That would be superficial for many reasons. First, the man in charge has been elected to his position by the other monks, and so his relationship with his fellows is wholly different to that between a lord and his servants. Also, the monastic refectory is a restricted area, and only monks may eat there. Important guests eat with the abbot in his lodging, less important guests in the guest house or at the beggar's gate. But most of all, it is the extraordinary customs about eating meat which have developed over the centuries which make dining in a monastery unique. Like everyone else, monks do not eat any flesh on Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, nor in Advent or Lent. In addition, they are not supposed to eat the meat of four-legged animals at all, according to the rule of St. Benedict. However, St. Benedict lived a long time ago, in the 6th century, and over the subsequent 800 years, monks all over Christendom have found ways to circumvent the rule. These monks mostly come from well-off families, 
and so were stuffed with the best and richest meats from the day they could sit up at their father's table. Then they entered the church and were completely deprived of meat. The result is that many of them simply crave it. And the rule states only that they should not eat meat in the refectory. Consequently, many monasteries have built a second dining room called the Misericord, where meat eating can take place. Also, although eating quadrupeds is banned, there is nothing in the rule specifically against eating offal, which is removed from an animal prior to roasting it. Realizing that all this is not wholly within the spirit of the rule, but realizing also that he cannot stand in the way of progress, Pope Benedict XII suggests a compromise. He says as long as at least half of the monks eat in the refectory, the remainder can head off to the misery court and gorge themselves on whatever meat they choose, provided it's not a Wednesday, Friday, or Saturday, or a day in Advent or Lent. Those who remain in the refectory must refrain from eating the flesh of quadrupeds, but may eat fowl and can include meaty ingredients, such as liver and other offal, in the cooking. On the non-meat days, everyone must eat together in the refectory and observe the non-meat rules. Each member of a religious community has an allocation of a gallon of ale a day, although the officers are allowed more if they want it. This is no hardship. Monasteries brew very fine ale indeed. When offered for sale, it regularly fetches one and a half pennies per gallon or even two pence. A few monasteries also have their own vineyards and make their own wine, but the majority import the wines of Gascony, like most large households. Wine is drunk only on saints' days, when the meal is more of a feast. Fortunately for the monks, there are 60 or 70 of those in the year. As with a noble establishment, not everybody in a monastery has breakfast. Only the abbot and the principal officers are likely to be allowed to sit down and eat bread and cheese in the morning. The others must content themselves with mass, in line with the old saying, the sacrament is a good breakfast. For most monks, lay brethren and guests, the first meal of the day is dinner. In the refectory, it starts with a pottage. Thereafter, depending on whether it is a fish day or not, you may be served umbles, that is, sheep entrails cooked in ale with breadcrumbs and spices, often served in winter. Charlotte, that's chopped meat, eggs, and milk, Dowsit, a custard dish containing milk, cream, eggs, sugar, and currants, or a rich cheese flan. Somehow, the Benedictine monks at Westminster managed to justify eating bacon, even though it is most certainly the meat of a quadruped. And so bacon and eggs, or bacon collops as it's called, is served in the refectory as a treat just before Lent. When the misery cord is functioning, the monks display a huge appetite for meat. Pope Benedict's compromise means that a monk may only eat in the misery cord for a maximum of 86 days per year. Hence, he looks forward to his turn, especially if it follows a long period of abstinence, such as Lent. The first course at dinner is almost always beef. The second course normally consists of more beef, plus three further roasted meats. Veal, mutton, pork, or goose. Lamb is eaten in late spring. Boiled pork in winter. At other times of the year, mutton is served. At supper, only one meat course may be served. Thus, most monks eat about 400 meat dishes per year. You might agree that this is hardly following a rule which dictates he should not eat the flesh of quadrupeds at all. Many species of fish also appear in a monastic diet. Every day, the refectory sees fried, poached, baked, and roast fish served at dinner. Note that it is only at dinner that monks eat fish. At supper time, they eat shellfish, such as cockles and whelks. About half the intake is preserved sea fish, 
whether salted, smoked, dried, or pickled. But as monasteries often have the tithes of parishes, or are institutional lords of manors in their own right, they can expect to be sent freshwater fish on a regular basis. Some of the largest fish ponds in the country are owned by monasteries, including Gracious Pond at Surrey, constructed by the Abbot of Chertsey in 1308. Gracious Pond extends to over 35 acres, and the ponds at Freshnam extend to over 100 acres. Thus, you will often find dace, roach, and bream served in the refectory, or that old favorite pike in gallant sauce. The abbot might eat more expensive seawater fish, like turbot, gurnard, thornbay ray, sole, conger eel, and salmon. It depends whether he's eating privately in his quarters with a guest, or with the brethren in the refectory. Oh, one last thing. There's an old traveling minstrel's trick, which you might want to keep up your sleeve. How guests are treated in a monastery is the decision of the almoner. If he treats you badly, or serves you the most miserly portions of food, or if you get given a vile and hard bed, go to the abbot and praise him to the skies for the generosity of his house, and emphasize the large amount of money which the almoner must have laid out on your behalf. My lord, I thank you and your worthy convent for the great cheer I have had here, and of the great cost I have taken of you. For your good liberal monk, your almoner, served me yester evening at my supper worthily, with many diverse costly messes of fish, and I drank passing good wine. And now I'm going, he's even given me a pair of new boots, and a good pair of new knives, and a new belt. The abbot will have little choice but to take such thanks at face value and bask in the fictitious glory. But have no doubt, the almoner will have a lot of explaining to do later. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you have an excellent year, and I look forward to talking with you very much more often. See you soon. Good night.